and okay. So let's officially begin. Can you see um, me and Carrie? You should be able to see us and you can either on the right hand so, um, top right, there's the view. And so you can either have it on speaker view or on gallery view. Um, you might wanna put it on speaker view so that you can mostly see me and Carrie. And then we will have time for, where we're gonna lead you in some writing. We're gonna put you in breakout rooms, um, but I don't think you need to see the whole, the whole gallery. So if you put it on speaker view, that will probably be best. Mm -hmm. uh, can most people see Carrie? I, I see. No. No? No, I don't see her. Only see you. We'll see her. I can see, I can see you, Nadia. I can see Nadia, just Nadia. Carrie, why don't you talk a little bit so you'll, it'll give you full focus. I yeah, I, I pinned, I think you need to pin me still, Nadia. Yeah, yeah. so if, if, if we'll just put it on speaker view and we're gonna alternate speaking. Uh -huh. um, and if you can, you can go in and um, right click on Carrie's image and um, okay. Carrie, why don't you raise your hand too? So at least you're like, but maybe like your zoom hand also, um, oh, yeah. <laughs> but that's, that's good. Um, and so if you, if you right click on her image, you should be able to see her at yeah, the same time. Not. So it's not switching back and forth, but if not, just put it on speaker view and you'll see me when I'm talking and you'll see <laughs> Carrie when she's talking and that will work fine as well. So either way is fine. Don't worry too much about the technology here. Um, okay. So let's officially begin. So come to a comfortable position. As you know, if you've worked with me before, I like to start um, by ringing a singing bowl and taking a breath together. Um, I'll just say quickly, I am Nadia Colburn and Carrie, Carrie Bennett here. Hi, Carrie. Um, we're gonna be introducing each other. And uh, this is really uh, an occasion in celebration of Carrie's new beautiful book, Lost Letter and Other Animals. Um, so we thought we would host this together. Um, but let's, let's take a breath together. I'm gonna just do that one more time. Connect your mind and body with your breath. And be aware that you're here in this moment and we're gonna spend the next about hour and a half together. Thank you so much for being here. I'm so happy to be with you all. Um, and I've been looking forward to this evening. So here we are. Uh, okay. So as I said, this evening, we're going to do a slightly different kind of reading. Um, we've notice a lot of similarities in our books. And so we're gonna have a discussion and kind of weave our readings into our discussion of our two books. And then we will lead you through some writing exercises that come out of our discussion. And then there'll be a little bit of time to go into a breakout room, discuss, share if you want, and then come back together and um, ask questions and have a discussion. So just a little bit, um, we're gonna formally introduce each other, um, but I just wanted to show you our two books. This is Carrie's beautiful book, Lost Letter and Other Animals. It's hard to see with the light. Um, and my book, The High Shelf. Um, and Carrie, maybe you can put in the chat um, if people are interested in getting our books, 
where they can get them. And we're also, as a kind of special thank you for those of you who are here, if you uh, get our books, we also have some supplementary materials that go with them that we can tell you more about later. Um, but if you uh, just send me an email, I think that would be the easiest because you got the Zoom link through my email with the subject letter uh, receipt and either with a receipt or if you already have the book, you can just show an image of my book or Carrie's book. Um, then for me, I have um, a reader's guide, um, a recording of my reading the poems, uh, some writing prompts that come from the poems. And Carrie, I know you're putting together a packet as well of things that go with your book. Do you wanna say a little about that? I'm just going to add, I realized when I had originally put the links in, they were kind of like all mashed together. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll create, I'll be creating a little uh, packet of, of questions and some prompts to get you thinking. Um, I teach a poetry class at my university. And um, when we read a book, I always have prompts that kind of model something after the poems that we're reading. So it'll be something like that where I'll, you know, have prompts where, you know, kind of ask you to do maybe modeling after some of the, the types of forms I work with in my book. So we'll say more about that later, but first just a formal introduction. Um, so Carrie Bennett is a Massachusetts Cultural Council Artist Fellow and the author of three poetry books, Biography of Water, The Land is a Painted Thing, and this third book, Lost Letters and Other Animals. She's also the author of several chapbooks from Dancing Girl Press, and her poems have appeared in numerous journals, including Boston Review, Cake Train, Denver Quarterly, and Jubilee. Carrie holds an MFA from the Iowa Writers Workshop and teaches writing at Boston University, and she lives with her family and incredibly cute little daughter um, <laughs> in Somerville, Massachusetts. Great. Thanks, Nadia. And then Nadia Colburn, um, as many of you know, is the author of the poetry book, um, the High Shelf and her poetry and prose have appeared in over 80 publications, um, including the New Yorker, American Poetry Review, Kenyan Review, Spirituality and Health, and many other places. She holds a PhD in English from Columbia University, is a yoga teacher, a student of Thich Nhat Hanh, a wife, mother, social and environmental activist, founder of Align Your Story Writing School, and lives in Cambridge, Massachusetts, just a few blocks from me, her good friend, Carrie. <laughs> yes. So um, we're going to just dive right in to some questions about our books. And, um, and then, as I said, we'll be weaving some readings into our discussion. So oh. you want to go, you, yeah. you do the first question, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, the first question sort of deals with, um, the topics of our books, because we noticed that we have very similar themes. So both of our books explore family life in various ways. Um, and Nadia, I was just interested in hearing about um, you talking a little bit about what inspired you to write these poems and what role does family play in the high shelf? Thank you. Um, so actually I got a question from someone here today because I sent out an email earlier saying, um, you know, if you have any questions, you can email me in advance. And one, the question was something along the lines of, sometimes poetry can be intimidating because I don't 100% understand it. Um, and so I was actually thinking about, that was kind of in the back of my mind. And it occurs to me that I think what motivated these poems and the process of writing them, the theme of writing them, was kind of having feelings and trying to express those feelings which aren't really experienced in language in language. So I think more than um, writing in prose where there's often more transparency between what's happening and the, the language that's being used to describe it my poems I think of as a kind of like translation between what's difficult to name and language. And so in some, to some extent, it makes sense that especially contemporary poetry can feel 
intimidating or confusing because um, if we read it in the same way that we're expecting um, narrative prose to work, we're gonna get something different. And I think it's exactly in this um, imperfect translation that, that that was kind of the impetus of my poem. So I was going about experiencing my life, but then there were all these things outside of language. And specifically these poems come from the experience of, they, I started writing them when many, many, many years ago, when mm -hmm. my son Gabriel was really little and he's about to turn 21. So that's a long time ago. Um, and, but this experience of pregnancy really um, blew things open for me because I was in a PhD program studying literature, you know, to be a literature professor. And it was so much about language and, and poetry was, uh, pregnancy was just so different. And so I think my, these poems in part started from coming from interrogating and trying to translate into language what was happening outside of language or not so much. And, and having a little kid who comes into the world not speaking. Um, and so I have a feeling that I'm talking too much. Let me, <laughs> um, but let me read a poem. I think that would be helpful. Um, let me just go to the poems I want to read. Sorry. So the other thing, so it came from this process of translation and, and family life as well, where I had this amazing, like my experience of being around little children was of so much wonder in the world and so much innocence and potential and beauty. And then there is also this world of so much destruction and violence and kind of translating between those two experiences as well. So I think of these poems very much as translations and kind of trying to integrate things that aren't normally integrated. So the first poem I wanna read is called Reading the Newspaper by the Open Window. And I think of it as a kind of anchor poem for this book. Reading the Newspaper by the Open Window. The world that is alone in its beauty with no consolation, the black walnut tree, the double oleander, the goats, always hungry. Who hasn't been seduced? Who is the wonderful me of happiness, of forgetfulness, of horror that must be a part? As if all were a word in another language. Now no one speaks. So that poem is really about trying to bring together the experience of the horror and the wonder and the beauty and that question of all. Um, and so a lot of the poems in this book are about bringing together different experiences, the experiences of the body and of the mind or of, so I have a long poem that opens the book. I won't read the whole thing um, about pregnancy. And um, again, about bringing together uh, different kinds of experience that often is outside of language and wondering how do, how do we put it into language. So this poem is in nine sections for the nine months of pregnancy. Seven. Across the terraced hills, more terraces, the olives, the only green, and the spindly bloom with its bright yellow blossoms, the land made to support them, the donkeys at evening carrying water, and below the aquamarine of the sea, now smooth as glass, that brings back open mouthed black plastic bags. Oh, little one, all this that is not mine to give you, what will I give you? Uh, and these poems were written in Greece where that contrast between the different elements, the water and the stone and the sun and the whitewashed walls was, just seems so elemental. There are leaves, so this is part eight. 
their leaves a thick, dark, unguent green, their fruit too dry to eat, the fig trees brush all night, one against the other in the breeze. Sound like the sound of rain in our own country. When you are born, may I recognize the unseen in my arms. Nine, came into the world. At center, a silence, activity a cry too high to hear, a rent in the sky, a single cloud, then will come. So I wanted to, again, kind of explore this intersection of silence and language. And these poems were very much about kind of taking as much language as I could out of them so I could have that kind of elemental experience on the page. And they're pretty, they're pretty spare on the page too. Um, so what about for you, Carrie? What was the kind of process for you of writing your poems? And uh, actually we weren't talking about process yet, but what's the theme that you were writing out of? Yeah, um, well, first I really liked uh, your way of thinking about poems as translation, and especially like putting words or not able to put words to difficult situations, which I also have felt. Um, yeah, I mean, this the newest book has um, kind of deals with a very specific situation. Usually my books are more concepts driven based on ideas or something I'm kind of working through intellectually. But this one, um, I kind of think of as the core um, is back in 2009, I reunited with my estranged grandmother. Um, my family had severed ties with my grandmother six, years earlier when I was just a teenager in high school um, and it had taken me years to come to terms with like how would I reconnect with her um, and so you know I was quite close with her growing up and so I worked you know not to get too personal but for a long time with my therapist I'm like how do I reconnect with my grandmother you know how do I go against my family and so I did this and then when I reconnected I found out my grandmother was in late stages of Alzheimer's so it was this really traumatic moment in my life where I'd worked and, and done all of this, um, just this sort of managing of, of my grief of losing her. And then I lose her for a second, a second time. Um, and so after I reconnected and found out she ha had Alzheimer's and was really on the precipice of, of um, entering the, the late stages of that disease, which is a pretty difficult disease. Um, I visited her twice in Northern Minnesota. And um, during those two visits, which occurred within about a year, I kept a journal of my time with her. Um, and that journal, you know, I tried to just record things she said, like in the first visit with her, she remembered me and she had minimal language for expression, but she could tell me she loved me and she could tell me she was happy to see me, which was kind of miraculous after not having seen her for 16 plus years. Um, and then the second visit, she had really declined quite significantly and um, no longer could remember me um, and needed really basic, you know, self-care help, like going to the restroom, you know, um, bathing, uh, dressing herself. And so um, I kind of think of the heart of Lost Letters and Other Animals as this um, section that I wrote that was based on my journal of the, those two visits. It's called Animals in Pretty Cages. And I really tried to sort of like, I guess, capture the visit, put expression to the trauma of it, my grief, and also kind of honor her in a way. Um, Cause it's a big, a big struggle when you go through that disease. So I'll read a few, um, a few poems just from that section. So you can kind of see like how I worked through, um, through that. And so they're not titled individually and um, I'll just read the number. So they're in couplets, two per page and they're 26. That kind of evokes like the alphabet, number of letters in the alphabet. So one, the body is old and doesn't know what is being done to it, just as the mind is old, undone in the process of forgetting and doesn't know what is being done to it. Three, like anything else, the body becomes angry if pressed or poked or prodded Though the original mind, memory filled, a white dog dead many years ago, has been replaced with a new mind, wordless, an arthritic finger pointing to a lake, hands cupping a face. The body still navigates the room, still knows how to grasp a doorknob to open the front door. 
13. Think a woman standing alone inside a forest of tall pines. Think empty wall, open window, the sea a moving canvas. Think blue, think blank. And in the picture, the body holds a doll. And in the memory, the mind never loses its way. 14. Up, up, the bluebird above, yes, at the end of the hall, on the wall, high and then there. See the blue, the little wings, it sits on a fence, way back, yes, yes. Oh my, says the body, look, look, it's so, and gestures toward the lake, it's so, yes, it's doing and very happy. And this will be the last one I read. 16, what exactly has weakened? How many months ago did you last see her? Can she construct sentences? Can she dress herself? Will she let you bathe her? So yeah, I mean, I, I really just used a lot of the, the journal um, entries that I wrote during that time period um, to try and capture a lot of what was sort of um, going on um, with that. Yeah, I love the way those poems just really get at the edge of language. And, um, you know, it's about Alzheimer's, but it's also about memory itself and how much is lost and where do we hold memory in the body, in language, um, in images. And, and I think those are questions. It's like taking these extreme experience that was also a very personal experience, but it's so relatable whether we've had uh, relative with Alzheimer's or not, because it's kind of a human experience. Yeah. So should I should I ask the question on process so you can go back, or do you want to? What do you think? Uh, either way. Okay. I, you, I feel like it's better for me, so you can. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so one thing uh, that Nadia and I have in common is that uh, it took us a long time to write these books and these poems, and it took us a long time to get them published. Um, and so, you know, I would just, and I actually realized that um, I haven't heard you talk too much about the process that you took in collecting the poems in this book. So I would love um, to hear you talk about that. Yes, well, um, probably people got a sense that it's been a long time <laughs> since the poem I read was about pregnancy and Gabriel's turning 21 this week. So that's a very long time. Uh, and if anyone had told me at the time that I was writing these poems, that uh, it would be so long, I think I would have, I don't know what I would have made of it. I wouldn't have been happy, but um, there is a certain kind of logic to it, I think. And um, so I was writing these books and I, this, this book, and, and I was really wanted to take language away to get at this silence, to get at this place beneath language and to, as I said, interrogate that. And um, I, a lot of these poems were published in you know, good magazines. My poetry career was kind of going well and I was a finalist with this book, I think more than 20 times, which is really a lot of finalists. And it's hard to be, be a finalist but if you're a finalist, you still don't get published. So um, something just kind of wasn't clicking for people. Like it was close, but no cigar. Um, and it was frustrating. And so I just put the book aside after a while and I just moved away from it. And I did other things. And I actually moved from writing poetry to writing prose because I felt like I needed to um, actually get back into narrative to figure out what was happening. So it was kind of from the feeling to the narrative. And then I wrote, started writing creative nonfiction, which I hadn't really written before. And then I started to um, explicitly remember uh, sexual abuse in my early childhood. So I apologize, I didn't give a trigger warning for people. Um, but that's how it was. It was like there was no trigger warning. Um, but the poems actually had known, they had a wisdom of themselves. And I think the poems were in their exploration of the spaces outside of language and the stories that the body had to tell. 
and the experiences of being a mother, but also of looking at that child experience. I think the poems were reaching towards that understanding, like the wisdom of the creative unconscious mind before my conscious mind had that, could put it together. So I needed to do that narrative work and then it all came together. And that was really like the integration in some ways that the poems themselves were longing for. So there's a kind of poetic justice in the book coming out once I understood that and could put it all together. And I actually went in then and revised the book once the manuscript, like I went in and revised the book before I sent it out. And then I revised it again once the book was accepted. And I wanted to really honor the way the poems kind of enacted um, this experience of not knowing, because I think that's something that poetry can do uniquely, but I also wanted to give it a little bit more shape. So um, I had a few poems that I wanted to read about that kind of show that experience. Um, and and I, well, I'll read some of the, I'll, I'll, I'll read this one first. So this is called Namelessness, which was trying to kind of explain a little bit the process of the poems once I understood it a little better. In the box, I put the body. There were no words for what had happened. Outside all the other boxes, in some, no movement at all, in some, dancing. The color, like a deep blue lake reflecting the color of sky. Who could say which was original, which the interior, which the exterior? Or like the color of the sky at dusk opposite the setting sun, all silver and the lake beneath all silver, as if something were about to happen or had only just occurred. So I wanted to in that poem to kind of have the reflection of the inner and the outer the object and the inner life. And then this is the next poem, trying again. And here's a little trigger warning, but it's just very spare. A hand in the dark, a body on the body, on my body, in the box where time stops. So that was as explicit as I got. But um, I also went in and put some other explicit poems, more explicit poems in about kind of, and I'll read just quickly two of them. One about the destruction um, to the natural world. And then one just about a moment of happiness. Um, so let's see. This poem is called Given. And I think it, it will be explanatory. Um, King Island Emu, Mariana Mallard, Pink Headed Duck, Labrador Duck, New Zealand Quail, Double Banded Argus, Hawkins Rail, Red Rail, Red Throated Wood Rail, White Winged Sandpiper, Eskimo Curlew, Colombian Grebe, Bermuda Night Heron, Ascension Night Heron, New Zealand Little Bittern, Small St. Helena Petrel, Large St. Helena Petrel, St. Helena Dove, Passenger Pigeon, Silvery Pigeon, Mortius Blue Pigeon, Rodriguez gray pigeon, boned wood pigeon, Sulu bleeding heart, black fronted parakeet, society parakeet, paradise parrot, night parrot, Cuban red macaw, Cuban kite, laughing owl, Alfaro's hummingbird, imperial woodpecker, braces emerald, Gould's emerald, bush wren, red sea swallow, white eyed river martin, Rook's blue flycatcher, bay starling, mysterious starling, black 
Lord, wax bell, whose songs we do not hear. Unfortunately, that was just a very, very, very small um, percent of the names of extinct birds that I had to choose from. And then one more poem that I added a little later, kind of on the other side, story. On little feet, you run into the room holding hands. The sun is up. You have discovered with daddy gray and black and white pebbles that you put into the green pail. You look up at me. You take one pebble out from the pail, then another. This is enough. So my process was, I think, to listen, a lot of just listening to the poems and seeing what they wanted to tell me, which I think is such a beautiful thing that poems can do, and then to write into them a little bit more. Um, so Carrie, will you tell us a little bit about more about your process as well? Sure, I'm also really glad you read Story because I was rereading your book a couple days ago and I love that poem so much. Um, sort of the simplicity of the ending, but it's very moving to me, um, especially having a young child and like everything is very wondrous to them. Um, but yeah, my, my writing process, I write a lot, but it's a really slow process. It takes me a very long time to figure out how everything fits together. And so I, I it really resonated with me when you talked about um, the wisdom of the creative kind of unconscious mind. Um, and I, I sort of think about um, think about it in terms of my sort of poetic intuition. And so I, I, I sort of like just, um, it's like I'm in a dark room and I'm just sort of touching the wall, <laughs> you know, trying to figure out like what I'm, what what's on the wall? Is there a doorknob here? Is there a window? And this can go on for years where I just sort of write, I write into um, the ideas and not quite sure how they're going to all fit together. And so for this one, it, it, this book really felt like a, a very complicated puzzle piece because I eventually realized I wanted the core of it to be that um, those poems that I read just a few minutes ago, um, Animals in Pretty Cages, and I had all these other um, series of poems that I wasn't quite sure how they fit. And so it took a lot of pretty in-depth revision to finally figure out how to start the poem, um, which sort of starts with a, a fable um, that leads us into the Alzheimer's poems more di directly. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, um, I did a lot of heavy revision to make them all fit and I it just took a long time to think about. And so what I'll do is um, I'll read, um, I'm gonna read, um, so I'll, I'll read, I guess I don't really title my poems. So it's broken into five sections with longer poem series. So I'll just read those so you get a sense of like, the trajectory a little bit. So the first section is called The Ghost Plants a Fable and then Animals in Pretty Cages. I'm gonna read from postcards from a memory collector and then I move to brain box portraits and then I end with lost letters. So I'm gonna read um, a couple poems from postcards from a memory collector. Um, okay. So I wake to find turquoise feathers in my mouth under my pillow, a butterfly wing large enough to cover my face. I'm trying to locate the place at the base of my brain. I think I will find my childhood there. It is as if nothing happened or did you die and I never even knew you. I wish I had made that cake. Sometimes I forget where my hands go. Last night, I dreamt we walked through a museum and you said, pick the painting you can't leave without. I chose one of a woman sitting in a field, her hands clasped under her knees. I don't think so much about meaning anymore. How many beginnings are there? A deer follows you until you become the deer, and then you know how it feels to hide deep in the forest. Memories won't return to you like a bush filled with doorknobs. Please don't lose yourself in the woods. Sometimes what is gone is also dead. And then I'll read um, just a few poems from the last section. 
lost letters. And I have this, this little description underneath that section title. So I write, these letter fragments were found in the North Woods, which there are actually North Woods in Minnesota. Sections of text are missing from snow thaw, severe temperature changes, and ice storms. Deer were found sleeping by the letters. Maybe I'm flying, needed this letter without comfort. When I go inside the rooms, my mind, walls I do not recognize. I'll read two more from this. So many beginnings, night is a blue chair, the body inside the body tires. Fire no longer means anything there all over the ground. What did you say something is happening far away? When I opened the door, many stones, an unwritten letter, land kept expanding, lake, sky, inseparable. In my dreams, no doors. And those last, um, more fragmented poems um, ended up being erasures of prose poems I had written um, many years earlier. And I was trying to sort of capture um, the fragmentation, you know, that occurs um, with memory loss and also with just like our own memories of the past, which are always sort of fragmented. Oh, Nadia, you're still muted. <laughs> I love the way there's so many like going in and going out and then the deer that keeps on appearing. And it's like, I don't know, that deer just <laughs> comes to, to have a special place in my heart reading the book. <laughs> um, so do we go to the next question now? I think sure. it's related to the kind of like interiority of it and the, the exteriority, right? And what's outside and how the act outside comes in and the inside goes out. I think we're both working with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, we also just by chance realized we were working with images of boxes and I, I have a lot of boxes in my books as you heard from Nadia's poems, she does too. And so um, I know that you, um, I'm really interested in hearing you talk a little bit about your use of Joseph Cornell's boxes in his artwork, um, which served sort of as containers of collect, sort of collected objects. Um, so that would be, I would love to hear just sort of your use of boxes um, in your book. Perfect. And then we'll hear about your use of boxes more. Um, so I thought I would just share uh, a few images. If I share my screen, if I can figure out how to do this. Um, I think this will work. So can you all see this image here of the Joseph Cornell box? So this, um, for those of you who don't know Joseph Cornell's work, he lived in Queens. He was born, I think in 19, early 1900s, died the year I was born, the month I was born, 1972 in December. Um, this poem is called Beyond the Blue Peninsula. This poem, this box is called Beyond the Blue Peninsulas. Uh, after uh, Emily Dickinson. And so all of his boxes really, there are these constructions where there's an enclosed space and then there's something that you're looking beyond. And so I was really inspired by Joseph Cornell's work when I was writing these poems and thinking about assembling the poems, kind of taking language as a collage to put them around and to create a kind of feeling through the poems. So here's a box that has a lot of birds in his boxes. So here's another one. This is a collage with a lot of text as well, the bird in the box. And then this is another a poem, a box that these all kind of inspired my poems, the sections, the little, and it, it felt like, so um, actually when I was really inspired by Cornell first, I, I went to it really lucky and I got to go to a few Cornell exhibits. Um, and so they just kind of filled my consciousness. And then I started reading about him a little bit and he lived uh, pretty much all of his life except for a few years when he was away at school in the house that he grew up in. Um, 
he was very, very close with his brother who was uh, in a wheelchair with cerebral palsy. And so Joseph Cornell, I always think of his poems, knowing his, I keep on calling them poems, his artwork, and especially his boxes, knowing his relationship with his brother, that they're really um, exploring confinement and freedom. And I think Dickinson's poems are very much doing that too, and um, in many ways. And so my poems, I think, are also kind of exploring confinement and freedom. So I'll read you my, um, my most explicit, I'll stop the share. No, maybe I'll keep it up while I read. I'll read you my most explicit uh, Joseph Cornell poem and then go on from there. The Physical World after Joseph Cornell. There was the opposite house, not lit by the sun, and the trees all dead like, cut by the frame. And we were lying there, trying to keep ourselves, trying to keep the other. And the other trying to keep the other that was just the same, with some little variation. And the brown shingle, and the brown shingle next to it. The world inlatched, of itself made, and the boxes the little boxes, each one just the same with some little modulation. And in the boxes, little partitions, and in the partitions, littler partitions. And there, in one, a bird. So these poems, again, they kind of wrote themselves. I was trying to explain a feeling, translate a feeling, really inspired, as I said, by Cornell. Later, it seemed perfectly clear to me that this is also about domestic life, but I'm not sure I 100% knew that when I was writing them, um, you know, and kind of becoming a mother, I loved it, but also the kind of enclosure of that. And then also the family I had grown up in, the enclosures in that, of that, and also the kind of ways in which trauma becomes kind of boxed in and um, we, we protect it, we, we, we close it off so that we don't, we, it's a protective measure, but then we end up closing down other things as well. So what we do to protect ourselves also traps ourselves. And I think that kind of dichotomy was working in these poems as well. Um, so, let me see. Here's a poem about another painter, Rothko, whose images are also very squares on squares and squares. It's called The Colors of Arrival. And the red, then the red that would fit around the blue and the blue into the red, then lines among, did I think, did I think differently? when I was in my childhood, the small purple in between and still the boxes, the things that keep inside and inside blue, a deeper blue and almost black when it is named, when I step beyond the frame. And it's another box poem. because boxes also are human constructions. So I tried to think about what's constructed and what's natural, which is another kind of theme of this book. Weightlessness. In the box, there was no beginning and no end, but an openness stopped on all sides by the edges. We built it with wood and painted it. And all along there was the future, which had no one direction and which in the box would never arrive at any one particular. See, things as they are, the questions we do not ask. So um, I think that would be a good segue 
into your poems, Carrie. Um, you know, what do we ask? What don't we ask? What's said? What isn't said? Um, and I will go to an image of your book, which has kind of box-like structure on the cover. So I'll share my screen again. Yeah, you know, what's so funny is I did not even think about the cover and the image as being a box. Um, <laughs> I've had two friends tell me that it looks like those little um, greenhouses that we all have to eat in because of COVID if we go, <laughs> if we go out. Um, but yeah, I mean, even the cover has this, this boxed in image. I think what I found so striking about this and how it relates to the book for me is um, there's a sense of, you know, emptiness. Um, it kind of made me think of a little bit of what happens with the brain um, when it starts, you know, degenerating really through Alzheimer's disease. But then there's this beautiful, like the, the air is sort of able to seep out, kind of escape. And I thought that was something really interesting about that image. Um, so like on this very intuitive level, I, I connected with that, um, though I hadn't really like explored exactly why with my intellect. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, there are a lot of um, boxes in my, um, in my book. The most overt is a section called Brain Box Portraits. And this, um, this image of the brain box was inspired by this really strange science fiction novel by B. Caitlin called The Vore. Um, and this is a quotation I start, one of the quotations I start the book with. So I'll read that so you can kind of like see this image. So this is from the novel. It was said that she was hunting stillness and that she carried an empty box on her back, a box with a single eye, which ate time. And I started becoming really obsessed with the brain. Um, and uh, then I had this image of the box. I started looking at um, brain MRIs uh, and I just really wanted to sit with the brain as a physical thing. And so I, I this was this one section that I created very um, consciously. Once I knew what the book was gonna be about, I wanted a series of poems that allegorically depicted um, how I imagine what happens to humans when we forget language to some extent. So I'll read a few of these um, so you can get a little bit of a sense, but they're, I don't know if you can see it, but they're very little poems in the center of, um, of the pages, sort of like um, miniature boxes or portraits. Um, so again, these don't have titles. Um, the brain box is divided from the body like a photographs an image. Press a flower in between each hour to preserve the exact measurement of loss. The mouth holds the wind like a light bulb holds light. Outside the throat, breath becomes ghost. The processing begins when the mind rewinds. The brain box counts time like a mechanical watch. It winds itself into a nest that holds each memory inside a bright blue bell. The mind hunts and hides the bells, hollows out a hole to hold. Hours become paper bags of flickering candles. Each bell contains a clue for how words are worn. In the first stage, the sky explodes into enormous purple web. Forests of coral bloom from the ground. In the second stage, all the rivers flood and birds grow horns. Thick sheets of algae cover buildings. Power lines echo cooing sounds. In the third stage, humans forget how to walk. And um, I'll read one, one more from this section. In the fourth stage, the brain box becomes a sun. Humans turn into a tribe of deer and there is only one language. At night, the deer shine from the fireflies that live inside their bones. Each day ends with the trees losing their leaves and each day begins with the leaves growing back. Um, so, I mean, what I, one thing I saw with my grandmother was that there was this real sense of discovery because everything's always new, right? Like the leaves could fall off and then they grow back the next day. And um, there was a real sense of childlike wonder in the first visit I had with her. So I was sort of trying to capture a little bit of that in some of those poems. And then I, oh, Nadia, you're muted. 
and I think that we're going to talk, it's, we're talking for a long time. So should we just quickly talk about the healing and then move on? Yeah, okay. let's just quickly do that and then yeah. we'll move on. Great. Perfect. Um, so I, I'll just, I can just say a little bit about that. Um, I was really surprised at kind of how healing it was for me um, to finish this project and to get it published. Um, and, uh, you know, the process of writing it was a way to contain my grief um, and kind of contain the trauma around this experience um, in both an intuitive but also intellectual way, which was helpful for me. I kind of could intellectually work through, <laughs> work through everything. Um, but I also was surprised that once the book was published, um, I like felt very free from, um, from it, honestly, like it was, it really, I had no idea, but it felt as if the book could hold, hold this traumatic experience in a way that I didn't have to anymore. And so that was very unexpected for me. Um, and something I just recently have sort of, um, recognized. So I'm just going to read two poems. Um, that I feel like maybe most directly deal with um, a sense of healing. And these come from the um, postcards from a memory collector. So we try to make a different wild with new rules. Sky as ground, cloud as lake. We decide all animals have their own secrets. From the balcony, I watch the sidewalk and imagine an opened mouth underneath. I wear the day like a bright bell in my throat. We live in a house where every animal was once our mother. Paper boats hang in a forest of doorways and the sky an endless sphere of gray feathers. One night a fox barks at us, the tip of its white tail there then gone. Aren't we all quick ghosts trying to settle ourselves into the night? Each tree, its own shining language. You sit on the floor like a new person. There are clocks and a miniature train circles the room. Light shines on the palm of your hand, such a small square of pink. The heart is like that too. If we are very still and don't speak, if we do this out of love. So beautiful. And yeah, the book is a box too, right? Um, the book, yeah, is our construction that we we put we put things in, and then it contains it contains it. And um, I often talk about how I find it really frustrating when people make a kind of distinction and dichotomy between writing to heal or therapeutic writing and writing that's more artful and like writing that is interested in craft. Because I actually think that's like completely misunderstands art. Um, to, to divide those two things and that it's actually in the construction, um, in the making of a beautiful thing as in Cornell's boxes, right? Like we're makers, we're humans, we're makers in that skillful craftsmanship that we, um, that we heal, that we, and that we do it not only individually, but through sharing, through connecting with others, um, and, and I think your poems do that so well. So um, yeah, also for me, I think really writing these poems was very healing. And um, as I said before, the poems, the poems taught me, the poems were there before me, the poems were almost like my guides. And um, it was like surfing through them to, to find the way, the, the way out and in some ways like the way out of the box for me. Um, so I was going to originally have a Joseph Cornell image on the um, cover of my book. And then I decided, wait a minute, I want to set that bird free. I want to let the bird out of the cage. So I will share with you the image, um, if I can get it just one more time, um, that I chose for the cover. Um, I chose this image of the sky, and this is from... Uh, painting, a Dutch painting, a Dutch landscape painting from the 18th century. And actually it's a huge painting and there's a whole like scene with people and lots of activity down in the painting. And I just took this little part of the sky with the birds that are flying free. And it's not like a perfectly blue sky, but um, I wanted to just like at the end of the book, 
opens things up. So I'll just read a little bit um, from the end of the high shelf. Um, and in the beginning of the book, actually the poem, The High Shelf is a poem about not having supports and feeling um, unsafe with not having supports. And by the end of the book, that kind of spaciousness feels freeing instead of um, scary. So that emptiness can feel, um, and this is also partly coming out of a kind of uh, meditative practice. And in some ways these poems predated that meditative practice but um, the sense of expansiveness that we can write into and that the poems can um, hold us kind of in. So I will read these po last poems about kind of opening up a little bit more. And I'll stop my screen. So this is another long poem at the end called The Open Page. And this poem is in 11 parts. And I'll just read the last um, three parts, very short. Nine, yet how to show with this borrowed brush, this foreign viscous paint, the vigor on the branch alive growing and then the object fully other like a stone carrying only the heat of something other borrowed, not its own. 10, I trying to piece together some story Placing one lemon here, another, 11, until it gets easier. I look away, everything is distinct. The self falls out of the picture and the lemon suspended in midair with the hand elsewhere and no floor and nothing to rest upon. Only from a distance, from afar off, the scent of the lemon tree in bloom now, the small white blossoms, so many, one by one, opening to the bees. And um, I thought it would be fun just to read a more recent poem because the poems that I'm writing since this book are so different. I think of these poems as kind of in the tension between enclosure and openness. And then the poems I've been working on since then have really been consciously trying to go into that space of expansion more and to kind of open up more. So this is just one more recent poem. You. You who were so quiet, didn't you know there was a symphony inside you? Didn't you know you were composing? Didn't you hear the calling? As if you had looked out over calm water to see the geese rise up in unison in front of the setting sun. Such a squall of fuchsias, violets, magentas, that sky and your whole being given to the one who rests in the great up flapping, the geese mounting higher and higher into the evening growing brighter and louder still. So uh, we thought that it would be nice to lead you in some writing yourselves. Um, and let's just go right into that. I think what I'll do is just lead a little meditation and then Carrie, you'll also prompt and give people time to write. Perfect. So come to a comfortable position. I'm gonna just mute people a little more. Um, let me see how I do this. The sounds are strange here. And if people need to leave early, Carrie, can you maybe just put into the chat if people are curious about where to get our books, um, where they can get them again. I'll also send out an email and I'll send out the recording. Um, and you can just email me to get those supplemental materials. Okay, perfect. Um, and that will be there later. So for now, just uh, you can close your eyes for the meditation, listen to the bell. Take a nice long deep breath, bring your hand to your heart, feel that point of connection.
And we'll be here just for a few moments to really sit with the silence, sit with ourselves, to let the mind relax. If you find it wandering off in thoughts, bring it back to concentration on your breath, just noticing the breath. If that's uncomfortable, you can find some other part of your body to pay attention to. Try to just be with whatever is without judgment. Being aware of your physical presence without judgment. And Carrie, whenever you're ready, you can read the prompt. Great. Um, so this is going to be a two-part prompt, and I'll read the first one, and Nadia will follow up. And we'll, I think, give you five minutes um, for each each section. So we've talked a lot about boxes, and you know, they're containers. They act as receptacles of safety for delicate holiday decorations or baby clothes. They help us move between homes and send gifts to faraway friends. Um, we can also feel boxed in by something or, you know, um, confined. And so I would like you to think about um, kind of what would you like to box away in your life for safekeeping or to contain. Um, so spend the next five minutes or so imagining that you're constructing your own box and placing an experience or a moment or even a meaningful object inside. Um, Nadia and I both sort of dealt with trauma with around boxes, but you could box away something joyful or beautiful too. Um, so we'll give you five minutes for that. And I can, I'll, I'll type a little bit of that in the chat in case I said too much and you lost <laughs> my thread. And then I will also share the screen so you can see an image if you like to work from an image.
So we've got about 30 seconds left. So try and finish up kind of capturing whatever thought you're on right now before we move on to the next one. That was five minutes, and now Nadia will add on to that prompt. So I like to just ring the bell maybe and take a breath together again. Stay in this meditative moment. And now for this next prompt, we're gonna be letting something out of a box or out of a cage. If what you've put in the box, you wanna keep in the box, keep it there for safekeeping or keep it there so that you don't need to deal with its energy anymore. Put that box far away, let it contain what was there so that it opens up other energy for you. Or maybe you're ready to go and open the box doors up. But you wanna find something and open the doors and right from that experience of opening up, maybe physically imagine what it would feel like to open something up. Uh, we both have a lot of natural imagery in our books. So maybe you wanna place this in the physical natural world. I'll share an image again. And if you wanna work with a few words, you can work with these words if you want, all of them, none of them, whatever works for you. Lemon, dream, wind, and deer. And I'll put that in the chat. And I will also in a moment share an image, but just go right into your writing time and enjoy.
Take about one more minute here and we'll come back together. I was maybe muted, so you didn't hear me when I said, take another minute, right? I heard you. Oh, you did? Okay. So the minute is over. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that. Take whatever you've written and uh, continue to work on it later, please. See what germinates from it. Um, we were going to put you all into breakout rooms, but we're a little bit worried about time. So I think we're going to skip that for today just so that we have time for question and answer and to all be together at the end. Uh, apologies about the time, um, but we would love to open it up to you uh, and to questions, to observations, to um, anything you wanna share. And just please unmute yourself. Okay, that's what I was going to ask. Did you want us to write in the chat or just start talking? Um, I think let's just see what it's like just to um, start talking and see how it goes. So was that you, Eileen? Yeah, I oh, was. So nice to see you here. <laughs> <laughs> and I love your sign. Yeah, some of my protests are behind me. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, please ask your question. Well, I was just going to say, I was amazed how easy it was to write how, how these poems just came out of me with your prompts. It was incredible. My mother also is like, because of what Carrie was talking about with her grandmother, my mother is also starting to have some short time, short term memory loss. And it just really helped me with a couple of stories that she's, you know, I've been spending a lot more time with her. And just a couple of stories she told me just turned into poems instantly from this. So thank you amazing i'm so glad it's a special formula i think it's like get silence and language together both maybe some images and then writing it's so effective but yeah i love the synchronicity too anyway so how are you going to say something so i just wanted to recommend um carrie or to anyone but if you haven't read it the madonnas of leningrad do you know that book i loved it and it is about an older woman emma gray from russia who is a survivor of the um siege of leningrad who is developing alzheimer's i think she lives in so that's that's the basis of the novel and i thought it was just so beautifully done the way they went into, or the author explored what this woman might be experiencing. Definitely so check that, that out. That was just, but anyways, I loved, I loved hearing from both your books. It was such a treat. Thank you. Thank you. I think Sarah, you have your hand up. Um, yes, thank you. I just wanted to let you guys know that I enjoyed this time so much. And, um, and Nadia, I, for some reason, I woke up late this morning and I didn't have time to do my meditation, even though I did some yoga practice and I wrote a little bit, but my whole day was, um, was lost. I, I was so um, looking for something to do. And, and um, 
all my stresses were back. So um, thank you so much for giving me something um, to calm myself down. And um, I really, really appreciate it. You're a lifesaver. Thank you. <laughs> and I will uh, really, I will get both of your books. They are magnificent. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. I'm so glad to be part of your evening routine now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, Reverie? Yes, um, I've enjoyed your other workshops also, and this was particularly endearing to me because I did put something away for safekeeping, but it could come out whenever it needed to. And I loved... I had never thought of something like that in the sense that it was protected until it was ready. I mean, I've even got tears. Um, I wasn't, I'm usually able to fit in your words, but I couldn't this time. I just was having this image of this freedom, but protected freedom that when it was ready and the lid was always open but it was there in case, you know? Yeah. So thank you. Thank you for sharing that and stay with that, you know, stay with that imagery, hold it, like take a mental, physical snapshot of it so you can go mm -hmm. back to it. And the thank writing you. really holds things. It can hold things that our body's been holding mm -hmm. in the page, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, do you want to? Sarah, I think your hand up was. Thank you. I had um, what I guess are just sort of, I hope quick, but specific questions for each of you about um, aspects of your books. And so um, for Nadia, it was, I was just curious, the poem about the um, birds that were extinct, um, the poem was called Given. And, and, you know, in a sense, it seemed like their songs had been taken. So I was just curious about um, that. And then I'll just say the other question too. This is for Carrie. Um, you had described um, one of the sections of your book as fragments of letters from the Northwards, but I was just confused if that was like literally, like what that meant really. Um, so those are my two questions. Thank you. Um, so that's a really interesting question about the, the title given. Um, it is interesting, right? Because um, it can, it can work in a lot of different ways. Like these are birds that have been taken away, but at one point they were given to the world. So there's the giving and the taking, there's that. And then I also think I was thinking about given as this is the given backdrop against which we live our life. That we, um, we know that birds are going extinct. And so everything else is kind of all of our dramas, all of the babies being born, all of the beautiful days, all of our personal tragedies are happening against a variety of different backgrounds. And this is one of the givens of being alive now. Yeah, so. Yeah. That makes sense, thank you. Thanks for the question. Yeah, and thank you for that question. I did not spend enough time, I think, setting up the background for those. Um, so yeah, the lost letters, I can just show you, they sort of look like this. Um, and what, um, even before I re reunited with my grandmother, I wrote a whole slew of prose poems um, that I felt like were not that strong. <laughs> and, um, I started, I still wanted to work with them. So I started revising them as erasures of my own poems. And so I would go through and actually white out um, the, the weaker words, you know, in my opinion, to try and bring out sort of the essence of what I was getting at in that, like all with all that language in the prose poem. And those ended up sort of being these fragmentary erasures or the, the lost letters. And so I started kind of conceiving it of, of it as like, actual letters that had been like left in the woods that, you know, had these holes because of um, exposure to the, to the elements. But I actually just did a erasures of my own work. Um, that, okay, so it was sort of like found poems yeah, from your own yeah, earlier. Exactly. Very cool, thank you. Yeah. Which is, it's a really fun process. If you're, if you're having writer's block, but you have a whole bunch of writing, just go through and start erasing things. <laughs> it's, I think it's fun. 
Oh, Nadia, you're. But that collaging, like we can add, we can take out. Like they're both, they're both um, empowering and fun experiences. Yeah. Anna. Hey, Anna. Hi. Um, this has been really great. I really, I'm, I'm kind of tired tonight and it was wonderful to have that moment of time to sort of breathe and, and write a little reflectively. Um, but I, I wanted to ask Carrie about um, what I love about your work, which I've read for many years now, is how you are, are able to create these worlds. Um, and often they, at least as far as I know, and they, they, you know, they contain elements of actual experience, but they are highly imaginative and sort of beautifully constructed worlds. Um, and I just wonder if you could talk a little bit about like the difference between writing that way and making those worlds and kind of trying to capture your grandmother's experience, which was very grounded in an actual like visiting and, and the notebooks that you, the notes that you took about visiting her. Like, what, how, did you find that you approached those two things similarly or how, how was that experience yeah. for you? I think I, I approached them really, I mean, very in very different ways. Um, I'm really interested in starting from an experience, but then working with it, um, whether it's like bringing in kind of over the top metaphors or images or surrealism. But with my, with that experience with my grandmother, I, there was just something about it that it kept me from wanting to play with it in that way. It felt like I had to stay with that experience um, and kind of, like I was saying before, honor it. Um, and I don't do that. Honestly, I don't do that very often in my, in my writing. And so it's a little bit of a unique, a unique moment. Um, and yet, you know, I, I didn't read these poems from that section, but I have these juxtapositions of metaphors where like, there's a very clear section of like, questions that the, the doctor asked, right, during when we went to her, the ER, because she had a terrible UTI, because she wouldn't let us change her diaper. And, you know, I just recorded the questions he asked us. And then next to it, I have a longer um, metaphorical passage about a canary and its feathers ch changing. And so I kind of worked a little bit with a metaphor and juxtaposition, but I really tried to preserve in those blocks of my grandmother, very close to what happened. Um, it, it felt like I couldn't, it, I couldn't change it, um, which was very different for me. Um, yeah. Thanks. I think we had Lindsay next. Hi, um, I have a question. Um, I've been writing since 2017 and I feel like I want to like, I have so many essays and poems. I don't know where to start to get themselves published or I don't know. I, I'm like, I'm trying to get some focus and guidance on where to harness that and, and um, I don't know, get them to be, be heard. Big question, but I think <laughs> one, one, um, and I know you're thinking about writing a blog, right? And and oh, yeah, yes. Yeah. Well, so I just don't know where to focus. Can yeah. come out of this reading is to kind of put your work together because I think there can be a lot of synergy in in seeing the themes emerge in your own work, and mm -hmm. and so we can feel like, oh, I have all these different pieces. I'm doing all these different things in my writing, and mm -hmm. kind of go back to them and listen to them, and okay. kind of see how they fit together and see what okay. the themes are and, okay. and then kind of decide, okay, well, what themes am I working with? So what pieces do I wanna kind of put out there first and what kinds of places do I wanna put them depending mm -hmm. on these kinds of themes? So you don't feel like it's this just like- Yeah, I so just- I wanna- So much all around you, but it feels more- Yeah, I have to like organize it. Like, would you recommend like me printing them out or like, that's a great idea. Yeah, I think that printing it out would be a great idea. Don't you think, Carrie? Yes, for sure. I 100% I think that <laughs> printing, and I'm very tactile, like I cut poems up and 
tape them to different poems and it's very much like a, a tactile mm -hmm. experience so I would highly recommend getting printing them out putting them on the floor and That's just like, moving them around mm -hmm. okay great great and and also like I do want to do the blogging but do you think I should focus on complying my work first and then do the other part or is it whatever I think what it's helpful if you, if like, if you're blogging, if you're more clear, like what's the main theme that you're going to be working around, mm -hmm. it will help set up your blog mm -hmm. and kind of figure out who's your audience and how does it fit together. And, and it can be great to have a lot of pieces that you're going yeah. to then kind of put out. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that will give you more structure if you, okay. if you kind of go back and print out and reread your work. And that's a lot of how, you know, books come to be assembled is, what are these themes here? We don't necessarily know. I think for yeah, well, maybe a little more than you carry. It was pretty clear what you were doing, but but yeah, looking yeah. and learning from what we've done. Yeah, because I I also get like I also get like a like a word in my head. I'll get inspiration or and I'll just write on it and it just flows out of me. Like it's like it's amazing. Um, and I love it. I want to continue to write and I do it because I love it. You know, I know I'm not going to make a lot of money, but I. I love to do it part-time someday, you know, but I understand it's going to take time and I'm patient. Awesome. Great. So. Well, keep going, everyone. Keep going. I think we're, I'm, especially me, um, mm -hmm. test too. Uh, it's a long game. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Ah, thank you, Lindsay. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on uh, the comment prior to the last one um, for Carrie on her poem about her grandmother. I just I just wanted to not let you know I had a very strong influence from my grandmother who lived many, many states away from us. But when they finally moved to us, she gradually went downhill and I was about 10. So there's this feeling of you, you, you want recipro reciprocity and it's not there. And you realize that their needs are greater than what your needs are at that point. And, but I, I just missed her so much because I wanted, she was, she was actually in our neighborhood then, you know, and I just needed to see her and talk to her, but it doesn't happen. Alzheimer's is a very, very uh, tragic disease, yeah. especially in the early stages when they know they're not functioning well, so. It really, really touched me. Thank you for the poem. Thank you for sharing that too. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Jill, it looks like you're next. Can you hear me now? Great. Um, I just wanted to, uh, I'm probably the least experienced writer here. I wouldn't even call myself a writer exactly. Um, but I was when I was six years old. I wanted to be an author and I wrote a poem every single day. And I then uh, have been a technical writer and then I joined with Nadia three years ago, but life circumstances meant that I have hardly participated at all. I wanted to say that um, what I find so incredibly helpful about both of you, Carrie and Nadia, is your um, openness and your being. And you each might talk about traumatic things, but it's clear how um, healed you are, how non judgmental. And I'm going through the biggest stress that I one could ever often imagine and have been for a while and I had two different competing very important zooms tonight yours and something related to something very serious and medical in my life and I actually talked to my therapist earlier and I said you know what I think I should go to them because the other one will be recorded and I just need to really relax and then I can listen to that tomorrow even though I need it to know it by Friday <laughs> and um just there's something to me had I read a book that had your prompts or anything you're saying that would not have done what your presence does there's just such an open airiness I also lived in Minnesota for a while and so your images are lovely and I lived right around the corner from Nadia for a long time <laughs> and um 
So there's a safety here that when the words came out, I suddenly, I haven't written in years and suddenly it just flowed. And I really feel it's because of what you two exude in your openness together with obviously being accomplished writers. So thank you. Thank you so much and good luck with everything that's happening. And um, it's beautiful that you took this time for yourself to like listen to yourself. Because I think it's that inner listening that so much of poetry is about listening to the inner ear, not just the outer ear. And that's, you know, what, what you're doing showing up here. Well, I also knew from the past from you that there's a calmness and an openness that fills me and it would calm me no matter what. <laughs> and so thank you. I'm so honored. Thank you so much for being here. Justine? Hi, um, thank you for inviting me, Nadia. Um, lovely poems and I will definitely get your books, um, both of yours. Um, I'm new to poetry. I was intimidated by it. Um, I'm 50 years old and I'm just um, being introduced to it uh, through a friend recently. And he, you know, he said, I was like, yeah, I don't think I understand it. I didn't do well in it. Although I read and I love to write and, um, he said, well, if you don't understand one poem, there's so much good poetry out there, just go to the next. And it opened my world and I'm excited. And here I am, just this, ex this um, uh, activity, I'm gonna be working on this. And I find myself taking out poetry books at the library and I, I'm waking up and like, oh my gosh, that sounds like a great poem. And I'm thinking in these poet poetic terms and, my traumas and my, you know, um, my confidence, um, you know, it's just, it's funny how it's all converging right now into po poetry, which I just shied away from. Um, and uh, it's, thank you. It's lovely. I, I can't wait to start, keep working on these um, and lovely poems. Thank you. I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Thank you for sharing <laughs> that. Yeah, and I just want to add one more thing, which is, um, you know, as a reader, especially follow your bliss, you know, find, find the, the poems that you like and read those poems and let them lead you to other poems. Yes. And, you know, sometimes you need a way in because um, poems can be hard at first. So mm -hmm. if, you know, stay with it or, you know, have someone explain to you what they like about it. But if, if, if I always say to, to writers in particular, read greedily. So read the things that feed you. Yes. And um, don't worry about the things that aren't feeding you now. Maybe later they'll feed you. What's but, been amazing is like yeah. even listening to yours, the, the content and it and the emotions. And uh, I mean, my goodness. Um, and yet they're simple. You know what I mean? Not simple terms, but, you know, I always thought, you know, these Shakespearean words and these big 50 cent words are these big ideas that I don't write like, you know, and um, so it just seemed out of my reach. And now I'm learning that no, you know, it's it do, it doesn't have to be, you know, um, this grand, you know, poet, you know, Delmar Schwartz or whatever, you know, it's it's it it can be so so simple and so beautiful, um, you know. So I mean, I I my world, I'm so excited by poetry right now. It's funny. It's like totally, you know. It, um, discovering Edith Wharton again or something it's just like oh my gosh and here I am 50 years old and this whole genre that I had just shied away from and I'm adoring it I'm just um <laughs> so thank you and this is really fun and you know and I'm enjoying practice like having fun with it you know opening I'm opening you know <laughs> so, thank, thank you. you thank you so it's so nice to hear that it's great <laughs> Yeah, and I think there's so many different kinds of ways that we can, poetry can be written in our language, you know, like Shakespeare didn't speak the way we speak, you know, if you were to actually listen to the way people spoke in <laughs> Shakespeare in England, it would be, it's like almost like a different language. So 
write in your language, whatever that is, you know, we have a slightly different language, but. I think in, um, in school, we were, um, you know, if you didn't, if you didn't get it right, and that's what happened. I mean, I loved English. I, my grandmother's a writer. I love writing. And, um, but if you didn't get it, you didn't do well. And so you weren't rewarded for, you, you couldn't like it because you, you know, it's just the way it was taught that I think. Um, and I missed out, but now it's, it, you know, I'm, I'm in, I, I even got a college textbook you know, on it. <laughs> Just, <Fun. laughs> so. Great. Awesome. Anyone else? Maybe time for one or one more question. If I may, Nadia. Yeah. Um, um, I want to, <clears throat> sorry, I want to have your opinion and your thoughts, both of you, on someone like me, who um, English is not the first language. Um, and it's, of course, I, you know, in my original language of, of Farsi, Persian, that's the language that Rumi um, mm -hmm. and, and Hafez and, and Hayyam, they wrote their poetries. But um, just give me some I guess, soothing words that I can still do it in English, even though uh, poetry, especially poems in English are so different than classical Persian poems. Of course, now we have the new wave of poetry since decades ago, but um, it's different to translate poems into exactly from Persian to English. Sarah, do you also write in Persian? Yes. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you you could write them in Persian and and then you know kind of have that be the original and then and then translate them. Is that what you do sometimes? Um, I try actually not to do it. Um, I mean, I I I've been trying to think in English and write in English, and then think in Persian and write in Persian when I when I do that, because. Um, I, I think like I'm, I'm not comfortable translating since you can't really translate word to word. Right. Um, it's, you know, you can translate the thought possibly, but, um, and that even is a little bit hard when you, you're writing a different language and then you want to translate the thought behind it into your second language. Um, I don't know if there's anybody else that you are aware of that has been doing that. I mean, I, I have a, my, one of my best friends is a um, Brigitte Bird. She um, speaks, her original language is, our first language is French. And uh, uh -huh. she got her PhD in the States and only ever written poetry in English. And mm. I, I think you should think of it as a real advantage because you, you're going to be looking at English language in a different way. You're going to think about words in a different way. And, you know, she also intersperses French throughout her, her poems. And so I, I think that um, you should just embrace, embrace that, um, that, I don't know, the, the, the uniqueness that you, that comes to your use of, of both of these languages in your poems. I'll, I'll do my best. <laughs> it's not... I, yeah, I agree. I, I, mean, I feel like I can often um, often tell if a poet comes from a different tradition. Mm -hmm. um, I was an editor for many years of uh, Anger Magazine, and so I was the, the poetry editor. And I just remember a few times specifically reading poems and feeling like these are really different. These are clear and lyric in a way that I'm really not used to. And I would read the poems first, and then I would see kind of who had written them. And in those okay. cases, they were all people for whom English was not the first language. And actually yeah. a lot of, a few occasions I remember specifically where um, they were coming out of kind of Middle East cultures, uh -huh. Arabic and Persian. And, and I, I could really hear it in their poems. Their poems really stood out to me. So, so we published yeah. these poems. Um, it was like, this isn't just the same as everyone else's. Um, and it had a kind of like lyric yeah. Beautiful, like clearness to it. So I would say, I would agree with Carrie. Um, that's your language. Your language is, it's all translate, all 
language is translation, right? Yes. To get comfortable with that, the nuance Mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. Well, that's very encouraging. Thank you, both of you. Uh, Sarah, um, and, and, and as, as, can oh, you do enjoy writing in Persian too? Pardon me, yeah. Nadia. <laughs> writing in Persian. Someone else is talking too. Uh, Karen, you. it's just me. I'm always interrupting. Sorry, but, who, but, <laughs> but Sarah, I just I just want to say as um, a, a possible audience for your poetry, I would love to hear you write in your most fluent voice. Mm-hmm. Um, that would that because some it's some the words are are a, um, a, how you say a condent or they convey feelings they they aren't the feelings they just hold the feeling and the, I think that the way that you can most fluently put down what you are feeling and what you are expressing I think I would feel that. Um, well, that's wonderful to know. <laughs> thank you yeah thank you for that Karen and I do have a question the the um the artwork is so beautiful the boxes I absolutely love them what is the difference between writing using the boxes as a prompt and writing an ekphrastic poem um Carrie I mean I think ekphrastic can mean a lot of different things is my understanding. What, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I, th- I think that those, the poems that you read, right, based on Joseph Cornell and Rothko, those are, you know, very pretty traditional, you could say ekphrastic poems that also deal with boxes. And so I, I love that art form and then ekphrastic um, form, you would go to another artistic medium, right? Like a, a painting or a song and you would write based on some, you know, a visual experience of it or somehow creating a story around that, around that other artwork. And so, um, you know, I think it just so happened that for her, you know, for, for Nadia's work, the ekphrastic poems also had to do with the boxes, um, which I thought was really interesting because paintings are these usually these boxes too. That was beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to see you here. Uh, I think we have time for one more. So, um, Martina. Okay, maybe I see two more. Just so we have Martina and Deborah, so that everyone whose hand is up will have a chance. So two more, um, Martina and then Deborah. Okay, am I unmuted? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, thank you, Nadia. Thank you, Carrie. That was fabulous. I just wanted to say that I got lost in that prompt and the whole um, box container. It really carried me away um, in a box, nearly, because I was I was transported. I was clearing. I was sorting. I was I in a metaphorically, um, or I'm not quite sure what the word is, but. Um, there was therapy in it. And so I was able to carry away what I needed to carry out. And it, there was so much depth and I just wanted to thank you for it because it just prompted me to, to just write and write and write. And um, yeah, it was very powerful. Thank you. So nice to see you here, Martina. I'm so glad. Thanks, Nadia. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, first of all, I just want to say thank you for this evening. And also, Nadia, I thoroughly am enjoying your 31-day course. And what's interesting to me is that I, I did your five-day trial, then I did the 31-day course. And what I'm finding is that I, I expected there to be stories, prose, and my poetry is coming back to me because I've always loved to write poetry from an early age. So I appreciate that. And I appreciate this evening and the imagery, the images that you provided to go with it. I found that inspiring. Um, the other thing I would like to say to the lady who was it, Jay, uh, Sarah, who just spoke about uh, speaking her in, her in her native tongue and writing so forth. I work with e- ELL students and I just wanted to make a little suggestion that might be helpful to her is that with our students, uh, when they, they learn the, to speak first and to help them with their writing, uh, very often we have them speak what they're writing first 
and perhaps it would be helpful for her to speak it and maybe even record it so she could play it back for herself and hear it. Um, that's just a suggestion. But thank you for this evening. Thank you for the, the prompts and sharing your work. It's nice to hear the authors share their work. Thank you. Thank you. And, and that's a great, I, for everyone, whatever your, um, whether you're writing in Persian and English, it's your native language or not, it's really great to, to listen to your voice and to, to listen to yourself. Um, so read your poems out loud, dictate them and listen to your own rhythms. Uh, and if you speak another language, then that rhythms of the other language will come into your English poems as well, probably, and um, you know, stand out in different ways. So um, just the multi senses that come in, in a poem, the visual, the auditory, the physical, all of those things. So thank you all thank so you. much uh, for being here. Those of you who are left, um, I will send out an email, but you know, you can buy our books on Amazon. You can buy my book on my website. Uh, you can buy Carrie's book through her um, publisher, Black Lawrence Press. Uh, do you want to put it in the chat just one more time, Carrie? Uh, I mean, I can, but. Anyway, it's, we'll send out an email, but yeah. thank you all so much for being here. It's so nice to see your faces. I'm going to put everything on gallery view just for one more moment. Oh, yeah. um, keep writing. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll do something again. This is so much fun. Uh, really fun, Carrie. Thank you so much. I love your book. So much fun to um, hear you read it and talk about it. Um, so thank you so much for being here. I'm glad your book is in the world. It's very new, so it's really exciting. Just a baby. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, thank excited. you everyone for coming and sharing this night with us. It was wonderful to meet you and see you all. Bye. Be well. I look forward to staying in touch with everyone and seeing you next time. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.